Welcome and thanks for checking out this online version of the Porn Diet presentation. First, let me give you a little information about our background. Now, sorry about that stock photo there. I promise we have heads, we just don't take a lot of pictures together. We are a team of mental health professionals who work within mental health and addictions at the Nova Scotia Health Authority here in Canada in a small program where we do assessment and treatment with people whose sexual behavior has crossed legal boundaries. So what happened was we started noticing more and more calls from people who ranged from medical doctors to other mental health professionals and even some community members themselves who were asking us if we could help with a patient or a client or even with their own porn usage. Now, as much as we would like to help everyone, as I said before, we're a small program with limited resources. So we did have to stick to our program mandate, which says they must have crossed legal boundaries with this behavior. And most of these calls were about porn use that was definitely a problem, but was often legal porn. So we had to turn them away. Turning someone away who is asking for help, especially someone brave enough to reach out and admit that they have a problem, felt kind of terrible and wrong, and we knew we had to do something. Enter the Nova Scotia government. One day, a call went out from the Sexual Violence Strategy, which was a relatively new department that had been developed after some alarming trends in sexual violence were noticed. They were offering what they called a Prevention Innovation Grant for people who were looking to reduce sexual violence or promote awareness through projects around Nova Scotia. Naturally, we immediately thought of the people who had been turned away, and we proposed to do community talks across Nova Scotia to discuss internet pornography, including what the effects of problematic porn would be and how porn could be used in a healthier way. This is how the porn diet was born. So away we went, dragging our trusty laptop and projector from community to community across this fine province. Our goal was to reach the general population, so we advertised accordingly with our posters and our Facebook page, branding the whole thing as lightly as we could in order to try to communicate that this was a non-threatening talk that was available to anyone. We looked for centralized locations that would be easily accessible to the most number of people, especially in rural areas, and we chose neutral and public locations whenever possible, like libraries or community centers. In total, we gave 14 talks across 11 locations, including two private talks that were requested by the local organizations, and our audience numbers ranged from 3 to 45 people. And now we come to the bulk of the presentation. What you're about to see is a slight variation on what was presented during our community talks. After some debate and a couple of lost battles with technology, we decided that it would be best for us to make this presentation available in the way that you're currently watching it, which means a cleanly edited version with a narrator that includes some survey data that we gathered during the talks, as well as addressing some questions that were asked. First, let me get ahead of some questions and concerns. As you can imagine in a talk about porn, this video will include some racy content. Seeing as you're on the internet right now, and you are either at a website or a YouTube channel with the word porn in it, I'm going to assume that we are all adults here, and you could be already accessing something just as bad, if not worse, with a click or two. Either way, there's going to be a screen with this symbol on it to tell you that something racy is coming in the presentation. We got a fair bit of feedback from the surveys that people were upset at the amount of focus that we had on males, particularly heterosexual males. As we said in the presentation, and I will reiterate now for this video, that's just because that's where a lot of the research is when it comes to problematic online porn use. We aren't saying that it can't be a problem in other populations. The resources and a lot of the content ahead is useful to anyone. Along the same lines, this presentation doesn't really touch on the effects that porn may have on women, which is another piece of feedback that we received a few times. This isn't by accident. We wanted to focus on the impacts of problematic porn that are less discussed and less known, and we felt that most of the time when porn is discussed, it's usually as it relates to women and victimization. Now, to be absolutely clear, we aren't saying that it isn't an important point of discussion, just that we are going to focus on other things in this presentation. There will be a lot of numbers included in this video as well, mostly in the form of percentages. It's important to share this stuff so that you can see that these are not just opinions and to really drive home the points that we make, but sometimes it can be a lot. If you get lost in the numbers, just know that there will be some slides to highlight the main points that we've made. And finally, we have a dedicated email address where you can send any questions or concerns that you have. That would be theporndiet at gmail.com. So what is porn anyway? 
This is an oil painting of a Parisian socialite from 1884. This painting was considered to be highly controversial for its time. If you look closely, you can see that one of the straps of her dress looks kind of awkwardly placed, which is because it was originally painted fallen down her right shoulder, but her family were so horrified that they forced Mr. Sargent, who was the artist, to paint it in its proper place. Even with the strap appropriately placed, everyone was still aghast, and her family pleaded with the artist to withdraw his painting from the exhibit, but he refused. Ultimately, she was humiliated, and the whole affair caused Mr. Sargent to permanently move out of France. So then, is this porn? Again, it really depends on who and when you ask. When Playboy first came out in 1953, it had nude images of Marilyn Monroe and was considered to be very scandalous. If you ask Cooper Hefner, who is the late Hugh Hefner's son, he'd argue that something like Playboy is art and not porn, like you can see in this quote. Now, we obviously had to add the bar across our nipples for the sake of this presentation, since we literally ended up in glass meeting rooms on the children's floor of libraries sometimes, not by choice, for the record. But for what it's worth, we also noticed when putting this presentation together that we didn't feel the need to warn anyone that this was explicit content and that it was coming for this slide. This next slide, however, does require a warning. So this is what porn looks like now. It's mostly streaming online. It usually depicts close-up shots of penetration or ejaculation into or onto various parts of people. It often doesn't include any touching at all because obviously hands get in the way of the shot, but more on that later. Most importantly for the sake of this presentation, here's what porn looks like now. Often there are several tabs open at a time so a person can flip through them quickly to access a variety of new people and often increasingly shocking content. Now for some academic stuff. Stay with me here. The AAA engine is a concept taken from cybersex research that explains why something like internet porn is so appealing. Let's first look at affordability. High competition between internet service providers means that the internet is getting cheaper and cheaper. Plus, there are so many places where it's accessible for free, like universities and libraries. Porn itself doesn't need to be purchased or even downloaded anymore since the boom in popularity of streaming websites, which mostly get their money from advertisements, so that would be a check. One of the most notorious aspects of the internet is anonymity. Many websites are devoted to anonymous chatting, browsing web pages is generally anonymous, and now with the rise of streaming as opposed to downloading porn, you can be even more anonymous. Even websites that require registration can be made under a pseudonym, and savvy users can prevent being tracked through things like a proxy, where essentially another IP address masks yours so that rather than the visit or download being tracked to your computer, it's recorded as an IP address that you select when you're setting it up. People can be more impulsive this way, with little to no worry about other people's perceptions of them. So that would also be a check. And what about accessibility? The internet is everywhere. It's on your phone, your computer, the library, even your bank. It's considered to be such a vital part of life that access to the internet is now considered to be a basic human right in some countries. It's available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And where there's internet, there's porn. And unlike in older days, where if you were reading an adult magazine on a bus, everyone would immediately know, if you're on your phone, you could be looking at porn, or you could be texting your mom. No one knows. Here's a little amusing infographic that illustrates the change in technology that came with wireless internet access, or also data packages and wireless plans. You'll notice that the size of the screens has consistently increased since we realized that we can view porn on our mobile devices. As I'm sure you know, as a person who lives in this world, Watching porn is very common. This study found that 46% of men and 16% of women aged 18 to 39 admitted to watching porn in any given week. But asking about something like this tends to be a bit tricky. Not everyone may want to admit how often they're looking at porn, especially to a bunch of strangers. If you look at the statistics from Pornhub, which is the most popular streaming porn site, you'll find that 61% of visits are from smartphones and 11% are from mobile devices, like tablets, which means that 72% of all traffic that goes to Pornhub is on mobile devices. 
And with new and increasing mobility and technology, people can and do watch porn from any end everywhere. On a bus, in the library, at school, at work. You might even have porn tabs open right now while you watch this video. So let's take a closer look at Pornhub, who release statistics from their website each year and, as you can see here, have a very excellent marketing department. Pornhub reported that in 2016 they had 64 million visits per day, which breaks down into 2.6 million per hour, 44,000 per minute, or 729 per second. That means when I say, one Mississippi, Pornhub has had 729 more visits. They stream so much data that in 2016 they had to measure it in petabytes, which we had never even heard of before creating this presentation. For reference, one petabyte is one million gigabytes. In 2016, they streamed 3,110 petabytes of porn videos. According to Pornhub, that's enough data to fill 194 million USB sticks. End to end, they would span 11,000 kilometers, or all the way around the moon. Canada, which has a population of 36.9 million people, had 186 page views per capita, which means per person, in 2016, which was only actually fourth in the world under, in order, the USA, Iceland, and the UK. Obviously, not every person in Canada is looking at porn, but there were so many page views for the people that are that it works out to be 186 page views for each person when it's averaged across the population. Bear in mind that when the population of Canada is calculated, it's using the entire population, which includes children, the elderly, etc. People who generally you'd think aren't really using porn. Here's a list from Pornhub of the most common search terms worldwide. You can see a lot of things that you'd expect, but I'd like to highlight how teen actually ranks second. Even though they were careful to put the 18 plus part in brackets, it's pretty unlikely that this was part of a search term. A number of those could be teens looking for teens, but many aren't. For the record, in Canada, despite our age of consent being 16, it's still illegal to have or view sexually explicit photos or videos of anybody under the age of 18, or even as being depicted under the age of 18, even with their permission. Back to the slide. There were some questions during our community talks about what hentai is, so I'll clarify that. Hentai is a Japanese animation with heavy sexual content and images, so there would be probably some overlap between that term and the Japanese search term, which is also on this list. All of our Pornhub stats came from their 2016 release because that was the most recent info that was available when we put this presentation together originally. But since it's on topic, here's the 2017 release for the same thing you'll see that hentai and Japanese have jumped pretty high in just one year. Here's a list of the top 10 search terms specifically in Canada in 2016. You'll notice that a lot of these are quite different than the worldwide list, and there are a rather alarming number of searches related to incestual relationships, especially to step relationships. We'd also like to highlight that for some reason, burglar is on the rise, but most relevant to this presentation and the info that will come later, VR and virtual reality porn, which basically mean the same thing, are rapidly gaining momentum. Virtual reality is interactive, it's 3D porn. You can imagine how you can impact somebody's motivation and expectations about sex when they've had many hours of experience getting realistic 3D sexual satisfaction from a person who has been scripted or programmed to be agreeable. Once again, let's pop back to the 2017 stats. You can see that VR jumped 14 places, which admittedly pales in comparison to Cheerleader, which appears to have soared up 366 places for some reason. We had a couple of questions during our community talks about Overwatch and why that specifically was so popular. Overwatch is a video game and there weren't some very obvious reasons why people were so focused on that specifically, so we took to internet opinions. There were some observations online that because Overwatch was highly anticipated and a few models of the characters were released before the game, some keen individuals out there took the opportunity to create porn from what they had. This was clearly popular and doesn't seem to be straying too far from the top searches, even in 2017. And once again, here comes some more explicit content. Imagine I'm a 10 year old boy and I've just learned the word porn. So I go to Google and I search for my new word, then click on the first website. 
The first thing that I see is not just a naked woman. As soon as I even click on the page, it's just GIFs, which are animated images of people having sex in all sorts of contexts with all sorts of people. Now in this here, you can see these are just stills, but when you actually go to the website and scroll around, those black bars aren't there. And all of the things you see are actually people engaged in sex with just no sound. So I select from the main menu the most popular videos, which are listed as the hottest. And since I'm in Canada, I'm scrolling through fully active thumbnails of videos with titles that are almost exclusively incestuous, since those are the top viewed videos in this country. And this is my introduction to porn. It's not even when you're actively seeking porn that you could find it these days. Look at this here. This is an American Apparel ad. It seems provocative, but in a way that maybe very young people wouldn't understand. However, if you Google Lauren Phoenix, like the ad suggests down there in that box, you'll see that she's actually a porn actress and you have pages of her videos to watch. Changes in technology over time means that the internet has become faster and people have changed along with it. Collectively, we have adjusted our expectations about how convenient and accessible everything must be. The creation of multi-tab browsing is a good example of how technology has evolved to encourage this rapid satisfaction in multitasking. However, what's happened as it relates to porn is that in one masturbation session, a person can have multiple tabs open and click through them to look at tens or even hundreds of people engaged in various sex acts with different content. In the study noted at the bottom of the screen here, they found that 99.5% of people said that they most often viewed porn through online streaming videos, but that's a pretty consistent number across many studies. Most people access porn this way these days, rather than going to a store or even downloading content. And not only are people accessing their porn online, but they're doing it frequently. One study found that 8% of people reported spending 11 hours or more per week online engaged in sexual activities. Now, 8% might not seem like a lot, but the study used a sample of 9,177 people, so 8% is 734 people. The bottom line here is that technology has changed when, where, and what porn is. So let's talk about what's going on in your brain with all this easily accessible, frequently used porn. Here's the very simplified version of the reward system. There's a chemical in your brain called dopamine that affects how you feel and it motivates you to choose things that feel good, like sex or food. If a behavior releases dopamine, that feels good, so you want to do it again. All addictive substances like alcohol, drugs, nicotine, they increase dopamine in this reward system. Sex and drugs access different nerve cells compared to other necessities like food or water. And this is why porn or sex is often referred to as a drug while discussing addiction. This is William Struthers, a neurosurgeon, discussing the neurological response to pornography. Well, I think it's, I think a better way of, of using the drug analogy is to kind of actually move away from it. Uh, because, because drugs are taken into the body and many people will criticize people in this field and say, well, pornography is not something that you consume into your body and gets distributed by the blood to the different parts of your body. Uh, so it can't be a drug. It can't be something that you have an addiction towards. But, uh, but I do think that what pornography is doing is it's taking advantage of that same system and just inducing it in a way that is deceiving the brain. The brain is really thinking that these women are in fact in front of you when they're really not. They're just pixels on a screen. Uh, but your eye picks them up as if they're the same thing. And so what it does is it goes in and it hijacks the system and fools it into thinking that something's really there when it really isn't. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the beautiful thing about media is that you can do that. But that's unfortunately uh, what happens with pornography. As more support for those who argue that porn can be an addiction, another neurological study found that people who were problematic porn users, and in this sample that means people who were seeking help for their problematic porn use, they have a stronger response in their reward centers when they're looking at a cue, which could be an image or a word suggesting that explicit content was coming, than they did to the actual erotic content. This is a similar thing that you would see in addiction research. An alcoholic gets a dopamine surge from even buying the alcohol, not even just the actual drinking. And if you think about it, when you're going to do something you enjoy, you tend to get excited about it before you're even doing it. It's a similar kind of process. 
Anticipation of a reward is motivating in and of itself. One study found that there was a lower amount of gray matter in a specific part of the brain for those with more time spent using porn. This is important because gray matter contains the nerve cells in your brain that send messages. Another study found that people who have self-reported issues with porn can be identified by the strength of their neurological activity in a particular part of their brain when they're looking at porn over people who do not report problematic porn use. The tricky part of neurological studies like this is, is that it's sometimes difficult to figure out which came first. Are people with lower gray matter in that specific area more likely to use pro porn problematically? Are problematic porn users more inclined to have had some kind of problem because their reward centers have stronger responses to porn? Or did these people start using porn then develop these differences as a result? Either way, there is evidence that the brain of a problematic porn user looks and functions differently. Let me interrupt here by noting some feedback that we got from Community Talks. By discussing biological structures and comparing humans to other mammalian brains, we are not excusing violence or offering a biological excuse for the behavior of anyone. Biology doesn't cause behavior, but denying that these underlying structures or mechanisms exist is omitting an important part of this topic. We are just discussing things as they are, based on research. So why is porn so appealing? If we go back to dopamine, a common phenomena found in nature is what's referred to as the Coolidge effect. Animals, but in this example, sheep specifically, are found to take longer to ejaculate when they're presented with the same female compared to new novel females. Experience with the same females releases less dopamine over time, effectively making insemination more difficult. Biologically speaking, this makes perfect sense. Since the biological goal of males is to spread their genes to produce as many offspring as they can, regardless of your own morals or cultural standards, the brain still functions in this way. Novel partners produce more dopamine. When you look at porn and you're able to see tens or hundreds of females in one masturbation session, or with each session you're looking at something new or different than you had seen before, which is often increasingly shocking because the same kind of image over and over again becomes just like the same kind of partner over and over again, your brain gets flooded with dopamine because it thinks you're doing a fantastic job of spreading your genes to all these different partners. So let's think about how this might affect a person's body and their sexuality. Your brain gets used to this rapid fire dopamine during a masturbation session when you have all these novel videos and you scroll through all of these tabs. So having a real sexual encounter is less stimulating since it can't really compare to that flood that you've been experiencing during these frequent masturbation sessions with all of that porn. Having the same partner as your sole means of sexual stimulation also means reduced dopamine over time, especially compared to the flood of the tabbed masturbation. All of this leaves you with a lower message of arousal being sent to your penis because, relative to what your brain is used to, real sex isn't all that stimulating. A lower message of arousal leads to erectile dysfunction. This is Gabe Deem from Reboot Nation, a website devoted to helping men who want to stop using porn. What's up everybody, my name is Gabe Deem and porn gave me a limp noodle. Now, you've probably heard it said that common causes of ED are things like alcohol, whiskey dick, cardiovascular disease, low testosterone, blood flow problems, side effects from substances and drugs, or relationship problems, etc. Important point, if your penis can get erect to porn, this rules out all organic problems as the cause because simply turning on porn and looking at pixels on a screen doesn't magically make organic issues disappear. If your dick works with porn, the problem isn't below your belt, it's in your brain. Now say what you will about those hand gestures, but Mr. Deem makes a good point. Studies since 2007 have shown evidence of porn-induced erectile dysfunction. These problems are also affecting adolescents between the ages of 16 and 21, with one study showing 45.3% of participants with erectile dysfunction issues.
The rising rates of erectile and other sexual dysfunctions are concerning enough in their own right, but an even bigger issue is that the erectile dysfunction that is being experienced is more frequently at a younger age than ever before. A review article in 2016, completed by a variety of medical and mental health professionals, found that the rates of erectile dysfunction, or low libido, in men under 40 were between 2 and 5% up until around 1999. After the introduction of tube sites in 2006, like Pornhub, YouPorn, RedTube, these rates saw a sharp increase to 14 to 28%. These are similar rates found in other studies, and these authors, among others, are connecting this directly to the rise in internet pornography, more specifically streaming porn. Now if we think back to Pornhub, 60% of their registered users were under the age of 35. Now keep in mind as well that these are only registered users, and not everyone has to register, or even click on a video, as we discussed in an earlier page where we saw that they're actually animated thumbnails it's highly likely that many of these users are lying about their age. A 2014 Canadian study found that 53.5% of males aged 16 to 21 had sexual problems of some kind, including erectile dysfunction, low sexual desire, and problems with orgasm. 16 to 21 years old is when males are usually in their sexual peak, and they're certainly at the early stages of their sexual lives. A slightly older, but still young, sample of undergraduate males, which were around 22 years old, also found that the men admitted using porn affected their lives in a negative way, like creating problems with their work or school or their relationships. This is Gary Wilson. He's an expert in how internet porn affects a person's body, brain, and relationships, and he runs a really great website called yourbrainonporn.com. We highly recommend that site for anybody who's looking for resources about the effects of internet porn because there's just a wealth of information on there, not only in the form of actual studies, but in, in videos and websites that he links to. It's very organized. He has a great way of talking about this stuff as well in a very straightforward manner that you'll see here. However, uh, looking at various studies in terms of sexual problems, we see that historically, since Kinsey did his first study in 1948, up to about 2000, very consistent stats across all sorts of countries that erectile dysfunction was about 2 to 3 percent in men under 40. Then, getting to 2008, 2010, 2013, we see it rising in some studies to 24 percent, 27 percent, 33 percent. And so that, of course, is a huge jump, nearly a thousand percent, depending on the study. So then you go, well, what variable has changed since 2000 mm -hmm. that could cause erectile dysfunction in primarily men under 40? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It must be stress, right? It must be stress because, you know, uh, my father had no stress. He, you know, went through yeah, the stress depression. didn't exist before the second millennium. Yeah, and then he fought in World War II, and then he lost jobs, and so he didn't have any stress. <laughs> and of course, he smoked. Yeah. And our, 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 my family, you know, everyone's family back then ate like crap, mm -hmm. and everyone smoked. So, yeah. Well, with <laughs> such a huge, dramatic rise in youthful ED, and this very salient factor of unlimited access to free hardcore streaming porn. It seems like the medical community must be all over this, right? Yeah, you would think so, but they're not. Uh, they're not all over it because what a doctor does is what he learns in school. Mm -hmm. So the urologists out there practicing who are 35, 40, 50, 60, they didn't learn anything about porn-induced ED. Yeah. So they think when a young man comes in, it's like, well, what's the problem? performance anxiety. So what do they ask them? Can you get an erection while you masturbate? But what do they leave out? Are you masturbating to porn? Oh. How much are you using? Yeah, so they don't yeah. ask if you masturbate to porn. So he is probably masturbating to porn. So he says, yes, I can get an erection. He's masturbating to porn. And the doctor says, hey, you got performance anxiety. While Mr. Wilson makes a very good point about physicians not picking up on porn-induced erectile dysfunction, especially in youth, there's another issue that precedes this. How does a young person know that the porn that they've been watching is affecting them? 48.7% of men reported that they had seen internet porn before the age of 13, which, if you're male, is likely before puberty. 
Now consider that a person's first sexual experience is around 16 for touching and oral sex and 17 for intercourse. Think about how many times a boy would have looked at porn between the ages of around 12 or less and his own first sexual experience. You don't even need stats to realize that this would change his expectations about sex, especially since we know that the porn is primarily online and we now know what porn online looks like. If you're looking at porn before you even have your own sexual experiences, how do you know if you're able to get an erection with a partner less than you should, or that your libido is lower than it would be if you weren't masturbating to porn all the time? You haven't even established what's normal for you yet, so how would you know there's a problem? All of these youth sexual issues as they relate to porn are why some people who work in this field are starting to suggest that it's important for the topic of navigating internet pornography to be added to sex education programs in school. A study suggested, quote, to counterbalance moral panic but also the glamorization of porn, sex education programs should incorporate contents that would increase media literacy and assist young people in critical interpretation of pornographic imagery. This would involve introducing safer web browsers, like those that filter out non-consensual sex, and teaching them how to think critically about the porn that they're seeing, rather than just consuming any and all porn that's presented to them. These programs could ask questions like, is this something you agree with? Are you looking at this because you find it shocking or because you find it arousing? Have you ever had a fantasy like this before? Or are you looking at this because it came up as a top video or because you think other people are looking at it? How much of this do you think would be part of a real sexual relationship? Now, we realize that sex education programs in school are a highly controversial topic, which we definitely will not be addressing in this presentation. We will, however, include this little comic. So the key points here are that kids are accessing porn before their own sexual experiences, and also, if porn and masturbating to porn is all that you've ever known about sex before you've had your own sexual experiences, you might just think that's how your body is, rather than realizing that you have a problem. This is Ran Gavrielli. He does a lot of talks about internet porn and his own experiences with being a problematic porn user and how that affected his life. This clip specifically is from a TEDx talk in Tel Aviv called Why I Stopped Watching Porn. My, in my private fantasies before watching porn, there was always a very strong narrative. And the narrative was of sensuality and mutuality, which means that I had always imagined what I will say to her. What would she possibly answer? What options do I have to respond? In real life, it never works like I planned, but it was super important in my mind in terms of arousal, the build-up, the location, the setting, where will it be? What are the circumstances of me and her being all alone all of a sudden? How will this bodily inflaming between us will emerge step by step? It was super important before porn. After making a habit out of porn, it conquers your mind and it, it invades your brain and, and I lost my ability to imagine. The important point that he's making here is that without excessive porn use, your sexual fantasies require an imagination, and they're personal to you. But if your brain is inundated with all of these repeated and often extreme or shocking, pre-packaged ideas of sex, then it becomes difficult for your brain to be creative in your fantasies, and your ideas about sex become more just memories of the porn that you've watched. With everything we've talked about already, you can probably imagine that all of this would impact a person's relationships, and the stats would agree. In a meta-analysis with almost 21,000 participants, they found that porn use, regardless of content, was associated with verbal sexual aggression, and although less strongly, also with physical sexual aggression. The interesting part of this is that it appears to have always been true, even before 1999. But think about how much more accessible porn is these days. And so it would likely be affecting more people now than it would have before the internet. An even more massive meta-analysis with 50,000 participants across 10 countries found that males, but not females, who had used porn had lower interpersonal satisfaction. For this analysis, interpersonal satisfaction meant contentedness with their relationships, with their sex lives, their self, or their body. 
Another study with 617 couples found that when men try to bring porn into a relationship, it tends to have a negative effect, but when women do it, it doesn't really have that effect. This might seem curious on the surface of it, but this next slide will probably shed some light on why. A review of 50 randomly selected best-selling and most rented videos in 2010 found that 49% contained insulting verbal aggression, such as being called a whore or a slut. 54% had gagging during fellatio, which is oral sex. Just about 30% contained choking and 41% had open hand slapping, not to be confused with spanking. Now this is the kind of content that men are watching more often, not always, but more often. Whereas generally speaking, women tend to gravitate towards erotica or narrative-based videos. So you could imagine why men bringing porn into a relationship might be less positive than when women bring in porn. In only 12% of these videos, the female had a negative reaction to the aggression or tried to avoid the harm. This means that in 88% of the videos, the woman either had no reaction to the aggression or they responded positively. Now all of this is pretty aggressive overall, and they found that the men in the videos were primarily the perpetrators of the violence, but even when the women were the perpetrators, it was towards other women. Another point about how porn can impact sexual relationships is that if kids are learning about sex from porn, it's important to know that only 2 to 3% of videos show the actors using condoms. With an overall low condom usage in teenagers, this isn't a very good message. People are noticing, and they're trying to put an end to it, but they haven't really had much luck so far. Proposition 60 was a ballot attempted in California, where they tried to make it illegal for porn to show sex without a condom, among some other safety-related requirements for porn actors. Despite the money that would be saved and the money that was backing it up, it was rejected 54% to 46% in 2016. So the point here is that porn use affects real-world relationships. So we start by using porn at a young age, often before puberty. Since we know now that dopamine motivates us to keep looking for new and novel content or people, the porn that we're looking at here is not just a naked woman in a magazine, but strings of videos and images of fetishes and sex acts limited only by your own imagination. So one day, a person who has been using porn problematically for years decides that it's time to get into a real sexual relationship. But then they find that real relationships are difficult, complicated, and slow. There are expectations and nuances that they'd never shown in porn, and the sex is usually just with one person, so after one or two times, if that, it's not novel anymore, which means that there's less dopamine and a weaker message to the penis, and often, erectile dysfunction. But there's still a sex drive there that has to be met, so we go back to porn again. So we realize that we've gone most of the way through this presentation, and all we've talked about has been the negatives of porn, or rather, of problematic porn use. But porn doesn't have to be all bad. It's about moderation and making smart choices. Some positive uses for porn are seen in couples counseling, since there have been some studies that suggest that when people bring porn into relationships, they can improve them. Now the key here is that it's sometimes, not all the time, and we know from earlier slides that it's more likely to go well if the female partner chooses it. Another study found that when couples bring porn into their relationship, it has a positive effect so long as the porn is instructional in nature. Instructional porn would show you how to improve your sex acts with your partner. Porn can also be useful in medical circumstances where regular ejaculation is important, like after prostate surgery, and there's some evidence that regular ejaculation can actually lower your risk of prostate cancer. For people without a partner, masturbation could be a way to do this, and porn can be helpful in sexual stimulation. In order to keep an eye on content, there are organizations like the Ethical Porn Partnership who review submitted and often amateur porn, and they stand behind their approved videos. Organizations like this are pro-porn. They're just building a supply of content that doesn't include excessive aggression or violence and only depicts consenting adults. The important question is, what fuels your porn use? What if you or someone you know has a problem? Well, you've come to the right place. This website, which for those of you accessing elsewhere is theporndiet.ca, has many resources listed to help you. Here you'll find links to websites, forums, and software discussing problematic porn use and what kind of supports are out there to help. 
During our community talks, we gave out a list of clinicians across Nova Scotia who we had confirmed were comfortable talking about sex, internet, or porn addiction. But since we don't want to keep checking up on the contact information for everyone, we'd suggest that you go to the Association of Psychologists of Nova Scotia, which is APNS, or the Nova Scotia Board of Examiners in Psychology, which is NSBEP, N-S-B-E-P, or your local equivalent registration board. You can also reach out to local support groups like Sexaholics Anonymous or Sex Addicts Anonymous. A quick Google search will help you find your local chapter and where they meet. Thanks for sticking it out with us this whole video. This was by no means a comprehensive look at all aspects of internet pornography, but we hope that you learned something new or at least walked away with information that you might discuss with other people. Like with most things, a really great first step in making change is to start talking about the problem. If you have any questions or you'd like to get in contact with us, please email theporndiet at gmail.com.